Hello and welcome to the rising tide of novel BTK inhibitors. I'm Dr. Anthony Mado from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. I'm pleased to welcome my fellow panelists, Dr. Katherine Coombs from the University of North Carolina and Dr. Nirav Shah from Medical College of Wisconsin. Today we're going to explore new developments with the BTK inhibitor class of agents in diseases such as CLL, SLL, and mantle cell lymphoma, but turn our attention to some of the challenges that represent barriers to effective care including drug resistance and intolerance, and explore how newer BTK inhibitor-based options can potentially overcome these problems. During this program, we will periodically share resources for making treatment decisions in challenging B-cell cancer settings. These will be based on the discussions you're about to hear. So please take a moment to download these practical tools before we get started. Finally, I'd like to note that this program is a second activity in an educational curriculum. I encourage you to view the first activity in the series, which features an animated exploration of the mechanistic aspects of BTK inhibitors and is narrated by my colleague, Dr. Nirav Shah. Let's begin. Okay, so for this intro slide, we have BTK inhibitor FDA approvals and current status in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And we can see we have agents listed there, which are uh, the first three, the covalent BTK inhibitors, including ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and zanubrutinib followed by the non-covalent BTK inhibitor, pirtabrutinib. Ibrutinib is approved in several settings, including CLL in the frontline and relapse refractory settings, mantle cell lymphoma second-line therapy, marginal zone second-line therapy, and Waldenstrom's. Acalabrutinib is also approved for CLL, SLL in all settings, frontline relapse refractory, mantle cell in the second-line setting, and is currently being studied in other B-cell malignancies as listed on the slide. Zanubrutinib is not yet approved for patients with CLL, but is approved for patients with mantle cell lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, and Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia in the second line and beyond. Pirtabrutinib, which is a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, is currently not approved in any setting, but is being studied across the board in B-cell malignancies, which we'll discuss today. Here we have uh, robust evidence really supporting the use of BTK inhibitors in CLL, uh, both in the frontline and relapse refractory setting. And what I'll do is highlight the individual drugs and then the data to support its use. Ibrutinib was the first in class BTK inhibitor approved for patients with CLL and SLL, and it's both approved in the frontline and relapse refractory setting. In terms of ibrutinib use, there are several randomized phase three trials demonstrating not only progression-free survival, but also overall survival benefit for this agent. In the frontline setting, we have three key trials that I'd like to highlight, or actually four key trials I'd like to highlight, including the Resonate 2, for which ibrutinib uh, demonstrated survival uh, benefit over chlorambucil, the Illuminate trial, for which it was combined with obinutuzumab, demonstrating a progression-free survival advantage over chlorambucil uh, plus G, ECOG 1912 was the combination of ibrutinib plus rituximab, which demonstrated PFS and OS benefits over FCR. And in the Alliance trial, ibrutinib with or without rituximab, demonstrating a PFS advantage over bendamustine rituximab. Acalabrutinib has two key randomized trials, one in the frontline and one in the relapse refractory setting. In Elevate TN, acalabrutinib with or without abinutuzumab was better than chlorambucil plus G. And in the Ascend trial, acalabrutinib is a monotherapy was better than either idelorituximab or BR in the relapse refractory setting. And the Sequoia trial is the uh, large uh, clinical trial looking at xanabrutinib, several arms, but most recently demonstrating progression-free survival superiority over bendamustine rituximab. Here we have current guidelines uh, for patients uh, with CLL and SLL. It also support the use of BTK inhibitors in treatment naive and uh, relapse refractory setting. And here you can see guidance uh, looking at patients across the board. BTK inhibitors are indicated whether patients are young or old, frail or uh, fit in patients with poor risk disease or with standard risk CLL. And you can see here um, that BTK inhibitors and or venetoclax are utilized in all of these settings. And here you see indications for acala with or without abinutuzumab, ibrutinib, and then venobin uh, as an alternative uh, choice as a BCL2 inhibitor. Acala with or without abinutuzumab for younger patients, ibrutinib or venobin, and then acalabrutinib with or without abinutuzumab, ibrutinib or venobin for patients with poor risk disease. What's noticeably absent from this slide is chemoimmunotherapy, 
And that's thanks in part to the several randomized trials that I already pointed out, which have largely replaced chemoimmunotherapy as a standard of care because BTK inhibitor-based therapies are superior. Even though I've already highlighted the really impressive data we have for the covalent inhibitors, resistance and tolerance and lack of standard therapy and treatment refractory disease pose challenges uh, in the setting of covalent BTK inhibitor use. And this is a slide that I put together recently, which really demonstrates that both resistance and intolerance limit outcomes with covalent inhibitors. Here you can see sort of a compilation from clinical trials, which demonstrate that between 41 and 54% of patients discontinue an agent such as ibrutinib after approximately five years. The same has been demonstrated from real world data sets. And so probably half of our patients will discontinue these drugs within the first three to five years uh, in the frontline and or relapse refractory settings. And what we have to deal with are intolerance events like AFib or arthralgias or bleeding or infection or progression. And when I talk about progression, I mean clinical progression. These are treat to progression strategies, continuous drugs. And so patients are on them long term. Um, they progress, they either can develop BTK, cis481 mutations, or downstream activating mutations in PLC gamma 2. This is another data set from the relapse refractory setting uh, presented by Steve Coutre. And you can see approximately 40% of patients discontinue ibrutinib in three pivotal trials with resistance and intolerance being the most common reasons for discontinuation. And I just wanted to highlight the most recent data from a clinical trial setting. This is the long-term follow-up data from Resonate 2. And this is the frontline trial of ibrutinib in older patients without a deletion 17P. Here you see 53% discontinued at seven years with the most common reason being adverse event and 50% of the discontinuations. And as we have patients who are treated with multiple targeted therapies, we start to wonder, what do we do for patients who are double refractory or double exposed to agents like BTK inhibitors and venetoclax, either in combination or sequentially? And this is some data I presented at the ASH meeting, highlighting that survival is quite poor for patients who are double refractory to a BTK inhibitor and venetoclax. And this is, an old, there's, this is one particular data set, but there were other data sets presented at the meeting showing nearly identical findings. This is a great unmet need and potentially represents an area where clinical trial data, and we'll highlight later data for the non-covalent BTK inhibitors, may perfectly address that need. Here we see additional data looking at median overall survival following cessation of covalent BTK inhibitor therapy in another disease that Dr. Shah will highlight today, and this is mantle cell lymphoma. Nirav, can you just take us through what it looks like for patients in terms of survival once they come off in a drug like ibrutinib or acalo or xanu? Yeah, great. Thank you, Anthony. You know, I think similar to the double refractory population you described in CLL, the unmet need, unmet need in mantle cell lymphoma is patients that fail a covalent BTK inhibitor. And you can see that these retrospective studies that tried to look at those patient populations um, found that the median overall survival after failing a covalent BTK inhibitor was very short. Uh, in one study, only about three months, and another study, 8.4 months. And, and really, it's almost like falling off a cliff. Uh, once you failed a BTK inhibitor, which is most often given as a second-line therapy in mantle cell lymphoma, uh, treatment options are limited, and, and this is really an area where we need better therapies. So, Nirav, is it safe to say then there is no standard of care in this situation? Well, with evolving cellular therapies, you know, CAR-T is becoming an option for those BTK failed patients. But as you know, uh, CAR-T is not necessarily a feasible option for all of the patients, especially the older patient population, uh, which is what many mantle cell lymphoma patients look like. So now we're going to uh, head into the section where we'll talk about strategic planning for BTK inhibitor intolerance, resistance, and multi-refractory disease in CLL. And we're gonna start with a case. Uh, Charles presents with symptomatic CLL and initiates therapy with a covalent BTK inhibitor as a title. So this is a patient who presents um, with CLL untreated uh, in the treatment naive setting. So this patient is 73 years old. They have comorbidities, which include hypertension, which is well controlled. Testing shows a quite elevated white blood cell count with an absolute lymphocyte count of 239.2. Hemoglobin is depressed at 10.8, and let's assume that's not from hemolysis. Platelets are 72. Let's assume that's not from ITP. So this is a patient presenting with stage 4 disease. 
They have abdominal lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly with the spleen uh, 19 centimeters uh, in length. They have a good performance status. Creatinine clearance is somewhat diminished, although honestly, for a 73-year-old, that's what we normally expect, even with a normal creatinine. They're unmutated for IGHV. They have a TP53 mutation on next-generation sequencing. And so this patient has several treatment options, as I already discussed, but the decision is made for the patient to be treated with ibrutinib as a monotherapy at the FDA-approved dose of 420 milligrams daily. They respond to the therapy well, they tolerate the therapy initially. However, after two years, they present with progressive lymphadenopathy and night sweats. The white blood cell count, let's say at its nadir, was 8,000 or, or 9,000, and it's now uh, quadrupled uh, to 32,000. And so this is, by definition, um, clinical progression. Uh, any comments, either Nirav or Kali, on the case? Any additional information you'd want? So regarding this case, I definitely agree we have enough information to confirm that Charles does have a brutinib refractory disease. Regarding the question of a resistance mutation being present, uh, I think we'll talk about that a little in the subsequent slides. So let's take a look at the evidence. Acquired resistance to a brutinib most generally is driven by mutations in BTK at the CIS481 site. This has been well characterized through a number of prior studies. So the C481 mutations are the most common mechanism of resistance. However, we can see mutations downstream most commonly in PLC gamma 2 at multiple hotspots. When you acquire one of these C481 mutations, this changes a brutinib to being a reversible inhibitor with decreased binding F efficiency and increasing BTK enzymatic activity due to the drug no longer being able to form that covalent bond at its site. There are some other rare resistance mutations that can emerge but appear to be quite a bit less frequent. So the BTK uh, mutations are interesting in that it also confers resistance to a calibrutinib and xanabrutinib. So all three covalent inhibitors that are available share the same mechanism of resistance through these mutations. This ultimately does lead to a disease progression and diminished efficacy of all covalent BTK inhibitors. So what strategies do we have against BTK inhibitor resistance in CLL? So the current evidence supports the use of the drug venetoclax, which I'll show some data on. This is a drug that certainly is efficacious, but it can be a bit cumbersome with respect to administration due to the need for tumor lysis syndrome monitoring and may not be appropriate for all patients. We also have some prospective clinical trial data looking at these non-covalent BTK inhibitors, which I'll explore a bit as well. The initial evidence suggests potent efficacy against patients who have these resistance mutations in the setting of progressive disease. Some other strategies have been tried in the clinic, including PI3 kinase inhibitors. Idelacib and Develacib are the two FDA-approved PI3 kinase inhibitors available in CLL. Unfortunately, the studies that led to these drugs approval excluded patients with prior BTK inhibitor therapy. So we don't actually have any prospective real world data from available agents on how these drugs would perform. We do know from real world studies that the PFS using a PI3 kinase inhibitor following progression on a BTK inhibitor is pretty poor, usually on the order of around six months though. And these agents also can come with a number of toxicities. Another option is chemoimmunotherapy. Um, this is also likely of limited benefit in this population, and many patients um, may have already had chemoimmunotherapy in the past. Something that I would say is not appropriate is the use of just a different covalent BTK inhibitor because of what I've mentioned, which is the shared mechanism of resistance. Venetoclax is an active approach in a brutinib refractory CLL SLL. And so here is uh, some prospective data uh, published by Jeff Jones looking at uh, venetoclax as a monotherapy in a brutinib refractory CLL and SLL patients. And so this was a study of 91 patients where nearly half had DEL 17P and they were extensively pre treated with a median of four prior therapies. We see a high overall response rate of 70% and uh, 
among the patients with DEL17P or TP53 mutations, uh, overall response rate of 61%, showing that venetoclax does have activity uh, among this patient subset. Nowadays, we often combine venetoclax with an anti-CD20 drug, and so in the relapse setting, this was based on the Murano trial, and so this was a comparison of time-limited venetoclax with rituximab. The venetoclax is given over the course of 24 months uh, with uh, six cycles of rituximab at the beginning. With uh, the comparator was bendamustine and rituximab. Uh, the study as a whole uh, showed marked superiority of venR compared to BR with improvement in PFS and OS. When we look at the different subsets, we do see that venetoclax uh, as a time-limited therapy doesn't perform uh, quite as well as patients without uh, DEL17P, uh, as you can see on this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, though. Now let's look at these non-covalent BTK inhibitors. So there are uh, three listed on this slide. Um, so MK1026, formerly called uh, ARQ531, um, or also known as nemtabrutinib, is one reversible non-covalent inhibitor uh, that we have some clinical data on. And this uh, does show activity in patients with the C481 mutation in contrast to abrutinib. Uh, the next drug, uh, which we have a, a lot of data on, is pertabrutinib. Um, similarly, is a reversible non-covalent BTK inhibitor uh, that also is active in the setting of these C481 mutations. Uh, lastly is the senesis compound, um, similarly a reversible non-covalent inhibitor, uh, though this one is uh, no longer uh, being uh, developed clinically um, at this time. So this is a schematic to show how these non-covalent BTK inhibitors overcome resistance in the setting of a C481 mutation. So abrutinib, of course, requires wild-type status at that C481 residue in order to form its covalent bond and downstream BTK inactivation. The non-covalent inhibitors are different, and so it does not matter whether the patient has a mutation in CA841, C481, or if they're wild type, because the binding site is different. Um, so the drug binds in a reversible or non-covalent fashion at a different site within the ATP binding pocket, allowing for the drug to be active uh, regardless of the presence or absence of uh, that mutation. We got a look at some updated results from the Bruin study at ASH in 2021, presented by Dr. Mado. So what we can see is that pertabrutinib continues to demonstrate a high degree of activity among patients with relapsed and refractory CLL and SLL. Here's the waterfall plot where you can see the great majority of patients had marked reduction in disease burden. The majority of responses were partial remissions, or PRLs, which is uh, typical for the BTK inhibitors as a class. We also were able to see a subset analysis showing that the presence or absence of BTK C481 mutation was not predictive of pertabrutinib benefit. And so ultimately, it appears that the drug works regardless of whether patients have this resistance mutation or not. We also saw a subset analysis showing that pertabrutinib shows efficacy among pretreated patients with TP53 mutated CLL, such as the patient in our case presentation. There is a high overall response rate of around 75% among this subset. So what's next for this drug in CLL? Uh, there are a number of phase three trials uh, in development and currently accruing. So Bruin CLL321 is a phase three trial comparing pertabrutinib as a monotherapy compared to the investigator's choice of idelacib with rituximab or bendamustine rituximab. There's also a study looking at pertabrutinib in combination with the venetoclax rituximab regimen versus venar by itself. And so, of course, I'll look forward to the ongoing results from those studies to help uh, further elucidate the role uh, for pertabrutinib uh, for our patients with CLL. Similarly, we got an update to the trial examining nemtabrutinib, the other non-covalent BTK inhibitor, at ASH in 2021 by Dr. Woyak. And what we can see from a larger cohort of patients is that this drug also demonstrates activity with an overall response rate of 58%. And we'll, of course, look forward to uh, future studies um, uh, and responses uh, from this trial as well.
Okay, so now we are going to go back to the case that we um, talked about earlier. Remember, this is a 73-year-old, relatively fit patient with rise stage 4 disease, unmutated for IGHV, TP53 mutation on next-gen sequencing, lots of reasons to treat, including anemia, thrombocytopenia, big nodes, big spleen. Started ibrutinib, tolerated it well for approximately two years, but then had a clinical progression of disease. And so now we can have a, a nice conversation about the case. Um, so we want to think about what are the next steps uh, for managing a patient like this. And um, to begin with, Callie really nicely highlighted the known um, data we have on mechanisms of resistance to covalent BTK inhibitors. Most of the data actually comes from ibrutinib, where we see about 50 to 70% of patients, if you test them with next-gen sequencing, will have a CIS481 mutation, then probably another 5 to 10% will have a PLC gamma 2 uh, mutation. But it will be nice to have a conversation about whether or not this testing is even performed at our centers. Is it needed? Are we, you know, if the, co the non-covalent inhibitors were available, would we make decisions um, based on this type of testing? So I'll, I'll, I'll ask Nirav and Kali, number one, do you, do you even have the ability to test for these mutations in clinical practice? Do you think it's necessary? If you can do it, will you make decisions if you have uh, multiple choices in this area? Um, I'll field that question first. Um, so yeah, I definitely do have the ability to send the tests. Um, I have before. Um, lately though, I've definitely questioned the utility because I don't think it actually would lead to any sort of change in clinical management, whether a mutation was present or absent in the great majority of cases. I have had some rare cases where it wasn't completely clear if a patient was progressing due to extenuating circumstances where I kind of, you know, thought, oh, if there's a resistance mutation, maybe that would really um, clinch that this is true progression. But I think in the great majority of progressions, um, such as the case that we present, if a patient is obviously progressing, um, the presence or absence of uh, one of the common resistance mutations to me would not change the next step, which is that this patient you know, likely needs another therapy provided that they have an IWCLL indication uh, for a therapy. Um, so I, I, I actually don't think it's that useful currently, but I'm interested to see your all's thoughts. Yeah, I, I, you know, Callie, I, I really agree with you. Uh, I actually, I'm not aware if we have the capability of doing this testing in-house, uh, mainly because I haven't felt an indication to order it. Uh, and, and it's for the reasons I think that both you and Anthony have, have stated is that, you know, whether or not we find that mutation is less important if we think they are clinically progressing. And it's the clinical signs of progression which are driving my treatment decision-making. And right now, the presence of these mutations doesn't necessarily uh, make you choose one treatment over the other. So, so I think that at least in the current era, uh, I'm not, you know, while this information is great to have, especially for research studies, so we can better understand how these mechanisms of resistance may play a role in, in determining the sequencing of future therapies. Uh, from a clinical practice standpoint, I have not found uh, much utility in, in ordering this. And I'll just join in uh, to the chorus here and say the same. I, I do order the testing out of more like intellectual curiosity to try to understand like whether patients in our practice are progressing in similar ways in terms of the resistance mechanisms. But I did find it particularly reassuring the data from Bruin, which did suggest that patients who had um, clinical progression had similar PFS, whether when you stratified the PFS by the presence or absence of a CIS481 mutation. So I don't think it's a biomarker for success of these drugs. And certainly, I still think when we see only 50% of patients having these mutations, that there's a lot more unknown than known about um, CLL and mechanisms of resistance. And if we delve later into the topic of mantle cell, then Nirav, it'll be a very short conversation about mechanisms of resistance because there's even less known there and yet uh, that particular class is active. Um, the other, the other um, thing I wanted to delve into here are what are the options for a patient like this who is progressing on ibrutinib? Unfortunately, after two years, which is very quick in the frontline setting, you know, the median progression-free survival from Resonate 2 hasn't been reached at seven years, but this is a fast progressor has a lot of resistance. Um, in terms of what are the other steps that we can consider? Well, 
if you think about using another covalent BTK inhibitor in this setting, think again, because uh, there is really no data to support switching from ibrutinib to acala or acala to ibrutinib, for example, given that the mechanisms of resistance are completely overlapping with these drugs, at least what we know of so far. Standard of care options could be to switch to venetoclax. If they're venetoclax naive and there's not a clinical trial option, uh, this would be the obvious answer with or without an anti-CD20 antibody. Both um, approaches are, are approved. You could be thinking about switching to a PI3K inhibitor, but Kali really nicely pointed out that the, the trials that led to the approval of, the, of drugs like idelalisib or um, duvalisib really never contained anybody who ever was on a covalent BTK inhibitor or venetoclax. And so we don't have pro prospective data to support the decision, but all of the retrospective data that myself and Kali and Nirav and others have generated have suggested that there's probably more overlap than not in terms of the mechanisms of resistance. And then of course, you could consider switching to a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. That's only an option on a clinical trial, and, and Callie really nicely highlighted the Bruin trial data and what trials might be available at certain centers around the country or around the world. As I've noted earlier, we've provided some downloadable practice aids that capture the decision points here, and they could be used to inform treatment planning, so please download them as a takeaway from this program. And as a final comment on this case, uh, Nirov, Kali, uh, you have a patient who's progressing two years on ibrutinib. You have the option to stay within class with a non-covalent or switch to venetoclax. Any thoughts based on your vast experiences using pyrtobrutinib and venetoclax, how you'll handle this case? Sure, I can, I can try and give my opinion first here. You know, assuming obviously that a non-covalent BTK inhibitor is you know, available and FDA approved, uh, to me, it makes a little bit of sense to maybe exhaust that pathway completely uh, before switching classes altogether. And so, you know, I think the data that, you know, uh, Anthony, you, you presented at ASH show uh, really a high level of efficacy, uh, even among those patients who basically were all ibrutinib exposed, either, you know, came off for toxicity or came off for progression. So I, I like the idea of staying in class with the non-covalent BTK inhibitor and holding venetoclax in my pocket as another option, uh, you know, should they progress with a non-covalent BTKI. Callie, your thoughts? I agree with that. I mean, I think venetoclax is a great therapy. Um, I would say the one thing that makes it slightly less appealing in, in this patient is that we know that patients with TP53 mutations uh, don't quite have as great of uh, PFS, um, especially when using Venar as uh, time-limited therapy. And so um, I, I would definitely consider um, Venar or Ven monotherapy, um, but I think if uh, pertubrutinib uh, or another non-covalent um, gets approved in the future, that, that that would be a very attractive and doesn't necessitate the you know logistical issues required uh, for venetoclax. So I think they would both be um, great options um, should they both be available. Thanks both for your uh, insightful comments on the case. Uh, let's talk about an alternative case now. Uh, and now we'll talk about intolerance. By far and away, particularly with ibrutinib, this has been the most common reason for discontinuation. Similar presentation in terms of patient age, comorbidities, um, hypertension might be more relevant uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, they present with stage four disease, significant splenomegaly, poor risk features, unmutated IGHV status, and a TP53 mutation. They also, the patient starts ibrutinib and responds well, but experiences toxicity at about the three month time point. Uh, two issues come up, paniculitis, which is not so common, but arthralgia, which is one of the more common adverse events associated with this drug. And the patient sort of muddles through, they dose reduce, they try a little bit of steroids, they try um, some other um, agents, but ultimately at the one year time point, they're unable to tolerate um, ibrutinib and they discontinue due to intolerance. And so now we'll delve into the topic of, you know, considering the evidence uh, for next steps for management of a BTK inhibitor intolerant patient. So there is a lot of current and emerging uh, BTK inhibitors that exhibit differences in specificity, mechanism of action, and potential for off-target effects. So on the top, we see all of our irreversible inhibitors. And so abrutinib, we've been talking about the most. That has the most um, uh, off-target effects, which you can see on this kinome map. And so the newer generation BTK inhibitors, uh, covalent BTK inhibitors, acalabrutinib and danabrutinib, 
have a bit more specificity in that they have um, less uh, off-target effects um, from their kinome maps. Uh, on the bottom of the slide, we can see all these reversible uh, uh, VTK inhibitors, uh, vecabrutinib, which uh, uh, we are not going to talk about much further, um, the arcule compound, which is now called MK1026, and uh, pertabrutinib, all with uh, really nice selectivity. Um, so the, the less selective VTK inhibitors do appear to have more off-target effects, and so this, of course, can contribute to more toxicity compared to the more selective agents. Um, so some of uh, examples of these off-target kinases that are inhibited by abrutinib are tech kinase, which can contribute to the bleeding uh, as an AE and also potentially cardiac toxicity. And then EGFR, for example, uh, may contribute to the rash that we can see with abrutinib um, on uh, diarrhea and potentially arthralgia, just as some examples. So now, um, just recently, we now have head-to-head -head data for abrutinib with these newer generation covalent BTK inhibitors, which is uh, really helpful uh, for our patients to know um, what uh, the head-to-head -head toxicity looks like. And so in the Elevate RR trial, which was published in JCO um, in 2021, uh, we saw that uh, not only is acalabrutinib uh, similarly efficacious um, in that they had the exact same uh, median PFS with a long-term uh, follow-up of 38.4 months, but it also has a significantly lower rate of any grade AFib and flutter, 9.4% uh, compared to abrutinib 16%, and this was a key secondary endpoint. Uh, it also showed lower cumulative incidence of a number of other AEs with the calibrutinib, such as hypertension um, uh, and arthralgia, which are uh, ones we really commonly acquire uh, or, uh, uh, see in the clinic. We also have head-to-head -head data with abrutinib with xanabrutinib uh, in the Alpine trial. Uh, one comment I'll make is that this trial does have um, quite a bit less in the way of follow-up, but we did get an early look at this comparison at EHA in 2021 and uh, saw really um, exciting uh, comparisons between the AFib flutter rate between uh, ZANU and abrutinib of uh, only 2.5% in the ZANU treated patients compared to 10% for the abrutinib treated patients. Um, so uh, with that trial, of course, we'll be looking uh, for longer term follow-up and see if that difference um, still uh, appears to be uh, as pronounced. We also have some uh, uh, phase two data looking at the sequential use of acalabrutinib in patients with abrutinib intolerance. And so this was uh, Kerry Rogers' publication, um, which shows that this is definitely a safe and effective option. And so patients uh, for this trial were eligible if they had intolerance to abrutinib, and then they were uh, subsequently given acalabrutinib. So we saw a high overall response rate of 73% uh, with a few CRs, uh, which those admittedly are, are quite rare uh, with using BTK inhibitors. Um, we also got a window into, of the patients who had a variety of intolerances, which are listed um, here, AFib, diarrhea, rash, bleeding, and arthralgia, how many of them had recurrence of that AE and was it the same grade or lower grade? Um, for the most part, uh, patients did not have a recurrence of their intolerance, but when they did recur, most of the time it was a lower grade, though there were a few patients who had a recurrence at the same grade. Uh, no patients had a recurrence of the AE at a higher grade, uh, showing that this is definitely a useful strategy in the setting of abrutinib intolerance. Regarding the Bruin study, to touch on this again, we also see that pertabrutinib is effective in the setting of BTKI intolerance. So in the initial publication uh, published in Lancet, pertabrutinib had an overall response rate of 52% in patients with prior BTKI intolerance. There has been a consistent efficacy reported in the recent Bruin update with an overall response rate of nearly 75% for patients who had discontinued a prior BTK inhibitor due to toxicity. So this may be another strategy that we'll have in the future. The other uh, promising finding from the pertabrutinib data is that it appears to have very low rates of these uh, class-mediated, BTK-mediated AEs. And so uh, what we can see in the red box is the AEs of special interest. And so there is uh, some bruising seen 20% um, of uh, the time. Uh, it's uh, grade one, only 2% grade two. And then these other class effects, uh, rash, arthralgia, hemorrhage, hypertension, and AFib, a flutter are uh, pretty unusual events with pertabrutinib, perhaps uh, uh, due to its high selectivity for BTK only. Thanks, Kelly. That was really a very deep dive into the intolerance issue, and it, it certainly hasn't been a major one. Um, so.
Let's now um, delve into the case again and try to decide how to manage this patient in a really tricky situation. So the patient um, that we described had an intolerance event. Let's say initially they went on to receive ibrutinib, um, maybe class switched to another agent like acalabrutinib, but ultimately progressed on that agent, went on to receive venetoclax rituximab, but had um, secondary progression two years after the end of therapy. So we would call this patient essentially a double refractory patient. And this is an area where we're all very interested because we want to come up with better therapies for our patients. So now let's delve um, into the topic of how to manage double refractory and I would also say double exposed disease. We got a sub-analysis from the Bruin trial at ASH in 2021 showing that pertubrutinib is efficacious in patients with CLL and SLL who had progression after both BTK and venetoclax. And so this is uh, exciting for these patients who really have very few, if any, standard therapy options uh, to see that uh, this drug can lead to a high overall response rate um, in the uh, low 70 uh, percent uh, rate with this drug. Another option is CAR T cells. So CAR T, unlike MCL, are not yet approved in CLL, but they have been studied extensively. And so this slide depicts data from the Transcend CLL004 trial, which uh, looks at um, CAR T in uh, heavily pretreated CLL SLL patients. Um, pretty small uh, study. So among uh, the 23 patients who were treated at two different dose levels, uh, we see that uh, 15 of them had had prior abrutinib and venetoclax. And so how do CAR T's work? Um, well, they actually work pretty well. And so um, we see a uh, high overall response rates uh, for uh, the patients in this study, and actually a pretty good uh, subset of patients achieve complete remissions. So this is another potential option, um, uh, albeit in the trial setting for now, um, but one that um, hopefully uh, we will uh, see uh, more data from. Um, in addition to getting uh, CRs, we also see uh, high rates of undetectable MRD. Um, and so here's the, the PFS curve um, from the Transcend CLL study, which also shows encouraging PFS um, for uh, these patients, including uh, those double refractory uh, patients who had had uh, progression on BTKI and venetoclax. Okay, so let's get back to um, our case. Um, let's think about some potential options for this patient. So again, uh, keep in mind uh, that there's a couple different situations we should discuss. In particular, in the setting of ibrutinib intolerance, continuing ibrutinib is likely to be beneficial, although I think we all have our maneuvers for trying to manage it. Sometimes dose reductions could work, or we all have some tricks. Um, we could potentially sequence to a more selective covalent BTK inhibitor. Cali presented nice data for Acala. Mazio Shadman um, has also presented data very similar for Xanabrutinib as being an option in this situation. Uh, certainly if the BTK is still an active target, it's worthwhile to think about a class switch, although I would caution really depends on the adverse event. Somebody who had a, a, a life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia or a major hemorrhage, we're probably not gonna do it. If somebody has, um, for example, arthralgia, it makes sense. And then non-covalent BTK inhibitors like pyrobrutinib could also be considered, although only in the context of a clinical trial at the moment. In the setting of the double refractory disease, it's, it's a totally different ball game. We have really no standard of care option that has really robust clinical data, uh, although PI3K inhibitors could be considered. Uh, Re-exposure to covalent inhibitors or venetoclax is unlikely to benefit. In this particular case, since they had a two-year remission to venetoclax, it might be a temporizing agent. We might be able to get some activity and or a durable remission. We just don't have a lot of data on ven retreatment. And then, of course, clinical trial-based options like uh, the non-covalent inhibitors, pyrobrutinib, uh, nemtobrutinib, like uh, Cali presented, or CAR-T therapy could also be considered in that situation. But of course, CAR-T would be in the context of a clinical trial. So uh, I want to briefly mention the take-home points from today's presentation. Intolerance is the most common reason for discontinuation of a covalent BTK inhibitor. Testing for molecular resistance to a covalent inhibitor is not indicated in clinical practice at this time. Following progression on a covalent BTK inhibitor, venetoclax remains a standard of care. However, data from the non-covalent inhibitors are promising, although not yet approved. And patients who are double refractory to covalent BTK inhibitors and venetoclax 
represent the largest unmet medical need in CLL. Now we're going to delve into uh, developing a model for optimizing BTK inhibitor therapy in mantle cell lymphoma. And fortunately, we have Nirav Shah with us, who is a lymphoma expert, and he's going to be really telling us about his experiences in this particular situation. So Dr. Shah. Great. Uh, thank you, Anthony, and, and thank you, Callie, for that excellent uh, discussion and updates of data uh, from the ASH-21 meeting uh, for relapse refractory CLL. Uh, moving on here to mantle cell uh, lymphoma, we're going to just get started with a case, and we have Sharon here, who uh, initially presented with mantle cell lymphoma at 67 years of age. Her presenting symptoms are the traditional B symptoms of weight loss, uh, and she had fatigue and spinomegaly as well. She had a biopsy that confirmed a diagnosis of mantle cell and a KI-67 of 50%, um, which in the mantle cell world uh, does correlate with an adverse prognosis. She was treated with R-CHOP chemotherapy and you know, declined to pursue a consolidative autologous transplant, which is still considered an option in the frontline setting. And after three years, she had unexplained weight loss and abdominal pain, and a PET CT showed disease in the chest and abdomen. And she initiates single-agent ibrutinib at a dose of 560 milligrams, but at about one year on therapy, uh, has now progressed uh, with mantle cell lymphoma. And so uh, what are the options in this setting, which is actually a very common situation for mantle cell lymphoma, and is she experiencing uh, drug-resistant disease? So let's delve into that a little bit further. So, um, you know, I think uh, Anthony mentioned this earlier that while uh, there's a good amount of data for resistance mutations in CLL, um, with about half the patients having a C481S mutation, in mantle cell lymphoma, uh, these mutations are uncommon, and the actual resistance is less defined. Um, there are primary resistance to, to uh, changes in cell cycle, uh, molecules such as SMARC-A2 uh, and SMARC-A4, TRAF2, um, and secondary resistance mutation are also present but on, uncommon compared to the CLL platform. And, and so really what I can tell you is that clinically in mantle cell lymphoma, outside of a research setting, uh, people are not investigating and looking for specific mutations because they aren't as well defined as they are in patients with CLL. And so this information is not as valuable as to in comparison to determining whether or not the patient is clinically progressing, which is done uh, with both symptomology and imaging as supportive evidence. So uh, these are the pivotal BTK inhibitor trials that got now three agents approved in the relapse refractory mantle cell lymphoma setting. And you can you know, see here the differences among these trials. So ibrutinib was the first drug approved uh, for, for, in terms of BTK inhibitors for relapse refractory mantle cell. And being one of the first agents approved, uh, you can see that the median lines of therapy was three compared to acalabrutinib and thanabrutinib, where really BTK inhibitors have become a second-line treatment option for uh, patients with relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. You can see here a similar sort of median age. And while there is a little bit of a difference in the overall response rate between these three agents, in my personal opinion, all three are very effective for relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. And the difference might be that ibrutinib was given, you know, more commonly as a third-line therapy compared to acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib, which were studied in a more contemporary time period. You can see here a problem that exists, which is similar to CLL, is a discontinuation due to the presence of adverse events. And you can see here that, you know, sort of a 6 to 9% uh, discontinuation due to AEs, uh, regardless of the agent that's being used. Now, we do see, uh, similar to the CLL setting, uh, differential AE exposure uh, with higher rates of, of bleeding and atrial fibrillation uh, in those patients treated with ibrutinib, which is a less selective BTK inhibitor compared to the newer generation BTK inhibitors, which are clearly uh, more selective for the BTK uh, enzyme and therefore leading to less off-target toxicities. Based on these data, though, BTK inhibitors are clearly uh, the preferred second-line therapy for patients who have relapsed mantle cell lymphoma and are currently being investigated in many settings as a frontline option as well. What about CAR T-cell therapy? So this is an option that is FDA approved for relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma. If you look at NCCN guidelines, it's approved as a third-line therapy, uh, but the actual label uh, on the FDA does allow it for just relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, 
That being said, given the safety profile of BTK inhibitors, I think the general practice is to use BTK inhibitors as a second-line therapy and reserve uh, CAR T-cell therapy um, as a third-line option, which is sort of what you see here uh, in the NCCN guidelines. Uh, what are other options available? Well, there's things like chemoimmunotherapy, um, ibrutinib, venetoclax combinations, lenalidomide, rituximab um, are also considered as possible second-line and subsequent therapy options. To get into CAR T-cell therapy into a little bit more detail, this is data from the pivotal uh, phase two clinical trial, the ZUMA-2 study for brexacaptogene autolusil, uh, which was uh, by Dr. Wang and colleagues. And really you see here remarkable efficacy. So the overall response rate um, for this patient that was all exposed to prior BTK inhibitor um, was 92% with a CR rate of 67%. And not only were these CRs and responses uh, high initially, they were durable, and the median duration of response, progression-free survival, and overall survival were not reached at a median follow-up of 17 and a half months. Now, while CAR-T is changing the landscape of hematological malignancies, I think that we've all come to respect that they do come with significant toxicities. And so you can see here that cytopenia has occurred grade three or higher in 94%, and serious infections in about a third of patients I think the most concerning thing is that grade three or higher CRS or neurological toxicities occurred in 15% and 31% of patients respectively. And for those of us who give CAR-T, that actually is uh, really serious toxicities, meaning these patients are requiring pressors and, and significant management um, for their neurological or systemic toxicities associated with the CAR-T. Um, there were two grade five infectious AEs that occurred as well. Um, so what does that mean uh, to those of you treating mantle cell? Is that yes, this is an excellent therapy, one we should definitely use uh, for relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. But thinking about the median age in which mantle cell uh, presents in, which is the seventh decade of life, you know, really may not be an option for all of the patients, especially if they have accumulated other core morbid conditions throughout their lifetime. So what else is uh, exciting and compelling in mantle cell lymphoma? Well, I think you've heard a lot today about non-covalent BTK inhibitors and how they can be effective um, for those patients who have actually failed covalent BTK inhibitors. And so the Bruin study did have a cohort of patients using pertubrutinib for relapse refractory mantle cell lymphoma here as well. And what you can see here um, is that basically all of the patients were exposed to BTK inhibitors. You have the dark blue line showing those patients who discontinued uh, due to progression, and, and the light blue line sort of are BTK discontinuation for toxicity or other reasons. Um, and really the gray lines were those who were BTK naive. And you can see here again that the majority of patients did have some form of meaningful response. To objectify that further, what was the overall response rate among those patients who were prior BTK treated? was 51%, which again was almost all the patients on this clinical trial, uh, with the best response and a CR rate of 25% and a partial response rate of 26%. And again, there was a proportion of patients that have stable disease, but again, in a disease like mantle cell lymphoma, we're not, you're not necessarily curing the disease with treatments like BTK inhibitors. Stable disease does have clinical meaningfulness um, for your patients if they're not experiencing progression. And so uh, what about durability? So if you responded um, to pertubrutinib, you can see here that there is durability. Um, and with the median follow-up of eight and a half months, 60% of the patients who did respond have an ongoing response. And so this is incredibly exciting. You now have an oral agent that can be taken at home. You know, unlike CAR-T, it doesn't require, uh, you know, referral to a tertiary referral center uh, where patients have to sort of reside within a certain distance for 45 minutes but you know, can get this therapy you know, having failed a covalent BTK inhibitor and have, you know, for a proportion of patients, durable response. So how does this agent compare to the covalent BTK inhibitors? Well, um, I'm excited to share that there's actually a head-to-head -head study using pertubrutinib as a, in the relapse refractory mantle cell setting against dealer's choice. So you know, the investigators can choose uh, their favorite BTK inhibitor, whether that be acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib, or ibrutinib, um, and this will be a randomized controlled trial uh, comparing those three agents against a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. And, and again, I'm very excited uh, to see that this study has been developed um, and is actively enrolling patients and, and excited to see how patients will respond uh, with both of these different classes of drugs.
So let's go back to our patient, Sharon, who had, you know, relapsed after second line therapy with ibrutinib. You know, and we talked previously, you know, that she was a healthy 67-year-old patient, uh, no major comorbidities, um, was treated with our CHOP and then ibrutinib and then progressed. And we did talk a little bit that, you know, similar to CLL, while you can pursue resistance testing, it really isn't something that I would recommend doing, at least outside of a clinical trial, because it's not going to necessarily drive your next decision. So um, what are the options here? So I think that, you know, obviously we talked about some of these options. One of them include CAR T-cell therapy, um, and the other include non-covalent BTK inhibitors. Um, but, you know, really want to get what my colleagues, Dr. Mato and Dr. Coombs, think. So uh, what would you guys want to do with Sharon, who has failed our CHOP and now is progressing on ibrutinib? Um, I could start. I think, um, you know, in this particular situation, we're dealing with a really young patient, uh, 67. She's pretty fit. Um, immediately, I would, you know, want to start her in another agent to control her disease. We all know mantle cell uh, can be a nightmare in the relapse setting, and you presented data on survival uh, post-covalent inhibitors. Um, so I probably would start her on pirubrutinib and then have a long conversation about whether or not that was a bridge to something uh, more definitive, like a cellular therapy, like CAR, or whether this would be a long-term uh, solution for the patient or a longer-term solution for the patient. My own take would be to um, start Pirto, treat to best remission, and then consider whether or not I would consolidate the response with a, with a, with a CAR-T product. I don't have a lot to add. I mean, I think that uh, is a good approach. And I think um, one could also consider going to CAR-T first, um, supposing both of these options were available. Um, and so, um, you know, I think um, the CAR-T, the logistics are just really tough. And so this patient had previously uh, declined an autologous uh, transplant. And so, you know, maybe her views had changed, um, but she may be a less is more type patient, in which case pertubrutinib may be attractive just as an indefinite oral therapy um, that um, doesn't require um, all the, the logistical um, and toxicity uh, that comes with uh, those cellular type therapies. Although I think the reality of the case is even if that strategy is adopted as, as amazing as the data look, I think it, you know, before she's 70, we may still have to face a, a decision about how to work CAR-T into her treatment algorithm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, and I see patients like this and, and you know, practicing here in Wisconsin, you know, we cover a very large geographical area in our state, and, and I see patients who, you know, uh, jump at the opportunity, you know, to get a cell therapy, and those who would very much prefer, um, you know, to, to try and maximize oral therapy, you know, stay at home, be close to friends and family. So, you know, I think what's exciting is that, you know, we have CAR-T available um, in mantle cell, and, and that's unlike CLL, though, although I think that in the future, CAR-T will also be approved in CLL. Um, and having another weapon like pertubrutinib, you know, when it, if and when it becomes FDA approved, will just give us more options and, and, and think the real question will then become sequencing of these agents um, and, and doing really what's best for each individual patient um, given their personal viewpoints and, and sort of life goals. Um, also, I want to note real quickly that we do have some practice aids here, uh, which include the information on this slide, which can then be used to inform treatment planning uh, for your convenience. So, um, you know, let's move on to what if she had experienced ibrutinib intolerance. So this is sort of the same patient here, um, you know, but developed atrial fibrillation after one year. And, and I think you can see here that we use similar strategies in mantle cell, uh, many of which, which were copied from my colleagues, uh, you know, Dr. Mato and Dr. Coombs from the data they presented in CLL. So briefly reviewing some of this data, um, there's uh, evidence for xanabrutinib in those patients who were intolerant to ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, and you can see here that really um, this was a population enriched for ibrutinib intolerance, which again is more common just given the non-selective nature of that agent. And, and you can see here that you know the majority of patients did not have recurrence um, of these toxicities. So you know 70 to 80 percent, depending on which was a former drug given, um, were able to continue the xanabrutinib. Um, and if it did occur uh, recurrence of toxicity. Uh, many of them had lower severity, uh, similar to some of the data that was presented in CLL. You can always sequence to other agents. Uh, the problem in mantle cell lymphoma is that, you know, outside of, outside of BTK inhibitors, uh, many of the other drugs that are available in the second or later line uh, don't really have an efficacy signal that is as promising at the B, as a BTK inhibitor class. 
So when you look at lenalidomide-based treatment regimens, again, um, this was a patient population that was enriched for those who stopped due to lack of efficacy. Um, the overall response rate was 29%, and again, many of these were highly uh, pretreated with most of the patients receiving three or greater lines of therapy. Um, so I would actually favor, if intolerance was an issue, um, switching class to uh, xanabrutinib or acalabrutinib, trying to continue them on a BTK inhibitor if they are having a clinically meaningful response to that agent. Uh, what about pertrobrutinib, you know, in terms of those patients who discontinued BTK because of toxicity? And I, I talked about some of this data earlier that you can see here in the light blue line, that patient population, and again, sort of uh, efficacy that was similar regardless of whether it was discontinuation for progression or for toxicity. Um, and you can see here deep responses. Um, and, and again, you know, we reviewed some of this data uh, prior on the prior slide when we looked at those patients who had progressive disease as well. So, um, you know, what about BTK inhibitors? How does it compare in mantle cell lymphoma versus CLL? You um, know, we do see more neutropenia, I think, in the mantle cell cohort of patients, and I think a lot of that is because we, unlike the CLL group, which has really evolved to a novel agent alone frontline approach, we still use chemoimmunotherapy. Um, and many of these patients will get an autologous stem cell transplant um, in the frontline setting, and so they are more prone to cytopenias, specifically neutropenia, which can then lead to more infections. Um, and then many of the algorithms, you know, we developed in CLL can be used um, in mantle cell lymphoma. You can switch classes to drugs like lenalidomide. There is data for venetoclax, although not approved in mantle cell lymphoma. You can use selective BTK inhibitors um, if you have intolerance. And, and I think there's very exciting data for these non-covalent agents, such as pertubrutinib. Uh, but Anthony and Callie, uh, any thoughts on your end about differences in managing CLL versus mantle cell when you use BTK inhibitors? Well, um, I think one of the major differences is that in CLL, we have um, better data in terms of outcomes. You know, we're talking about frontline strategies where at seven years, we haven't reached the median PFS. Um, you guys uh, or in the relapse refractory setting. You're looking at like 40 to 50 month median PFS with single agents. And unfortunately for patients with mantle cell, probably the most genetically unstable lymphoma outside of maybe Burkitt, um, this is a disease that um, just knows how to get around single agent targeted therapies. And so, you know, while you can start a drug and hope to get it two years out of it, your sequencing strategy has to be much more of a clinical trial setting than for us because you run out of standards of care very quickly. Great. Well, thank you uh, for your thoughts on that. My upbeat thoughts. Uh, sorry, but reality. <laughs> yeah, no, and I totally agree with you. You know, obviously the response rates in relapsed mantle cell um, are, are not as good, you know, compared to ibrutinib, you know, in the relapsed refractory setting when given after chemoimmunotherapy. Um, the, you know, progression-free survival is clearly shorter and, and really is why there are more uh, really an unmet need Uh, which is, you know, my take-home point is for relapsed mantle cell lymphoma that fails a covalent BTK inhibitor, um, you know, there are, it really is an unmet need for new options. Um, I think CAR T-cell therapy is one such option uh, for that patient population, but as we discussed, the toxicity profile, the logistical challenges, um, you know, in, in a country that has so many geographical differences really limits the widespread accessibility um, of this treatment to our entire patient population. I think pertubrutinib, you know, a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, uh, once approved, uh, may be a new option, you know, that is exciting from efficacy standpoint and has a favorable safety profile given how selective it is for the BTK enzyme. And really, I'm excited for the Bruin MCL study, you know, to have a head-to-head -head trial uh, comparing a non-covalent versus a covalent BTK um, is going to inform not only the MCL field, um, but also the CLL field about how this agent compares from a toxicity standpoint. Um, and in mantle cell, how it compares from an efficacy standpoint. Thanks, Nirav, for um, taking us through the mantle cell section. Uh, really informative and really helps to paint where the unmet needs are. Uh, to the audience, uh, this concludes our case-based discussion. I hope you've learned some important strategies that can be used when treating patients with BTK inhibitors in the setting of disease progression, including when faced with therapeutic resistance, intolerance, or double refractory disease. Thank you, Kelly and Nirav, for joining uh, this discussion. Uh, great work and so happy to have this interactive dialogue.
And thank you to our viewers. I hope you found this activity informative and useful to your practice. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.